Good afternoon. Let's get started. Our speaker next week will be Professor Brian A. Corkle, who is a professor in the chemical engineering department here, and he'll talk to us about next generation photovoltaic technologies. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Lori Benier, who is, a, who is an associate professor of environmental economics and policy at the Nicholas School of Environment at Duke University. She also holds secondary appointments there in the Sanford School of Public Policy and the Department of Economics. She got her PhD from, in public policy from Harvard and an MA in economics from Yale and a bachelor's degree in economics and environmental studies from Occidental College. Her research, uh, which you will get to see uh, in a few moments, looks broadly at evaluating a range of environmental policies and also focuses on improving methods and techniques used to evaluate uh, those types of policies. Her research ha has been funded by many agencies, including the National Science Foundation, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the US EPA, and also the Department of uh, Agriculture. It's a great pleasure to have you here, Lori. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is this on? Yes, it's clearly on. Okay, so thanks, uh, Varun, for inviting me to, to come speak to you in the seminar, and thanks to all of you who took time out of your evening on this very beautiful January day uh, to come in this, in this window, this room, and, and listen to me talk about regulation of offshore oil and gas. I'll try to make it worth your time. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about a comparative study that I've been working on that looks at uh, differences in regulatory regimes for offshore oil and gas. Um, we're really going to focus today on industrialized democracies, so the US, UK, and Norway. Uh, just to give you a sense, this is actually part, a spin-off of a much larger book project that I've been working on with two law professors at Duke and a historian at Duke. Um, and that book will be forthcoming, Cambridge University Press, later this year, called Policy Shock. And it looks at regulatory responses to oil spills, nuclear accidents, and financial meltdowns. And so, you know, back in 2010, uh, I was sitting around with my collaborators and we were saying, wow, like, you know, we just had a financial meltdown, we had Deepwater Horizon, Fukushima, and throughout the news, there seemed to be a lot of blame or concern that regulatory regimes were responsible, at least in part, for those various different disasters. And so, uh, and in all three regimes, there were movements afoot to significantly change the policies about them. So we started thinking about under what circumstances do policies respond to crises and under what circumstances do they do them well? Under what circumstances do they do that poorly? What can we learn from examining policy response to crises in a variety of different policy domains? Um, but today I'm really going to focus on the oil. This was really motivated by the Deepwater Horizon slash Macondo slash BP, whatever you want to call it, um, spill back in um, 2010. And, the, and, and that got me to think about uh, what, were the, what was the regulatory regime like in the U.S. and how did that compare to other major oil producers of similar um, industrial and economic status. So I'm getting some feedback. I'll step back. Um, so the conventional wisdom on this is that the U.S has a highly prescriptive command and control approach to regulation, and that's not that different in oil and gas as it is in other areas of environmental policy. That's sort of the conventional wisdom. Whereas Norway has this goal-oriented or risk-based approach that's collaborative between industry, government, and labor. And the UK then is some sort of hybrid of the two where it has some of the goal-based approaches from the Norwegian system combined with a more US-like enforcement structure than what they have in Norway. And so I wanted to look at whether or not there's any truth to this conventional wisdom, how this has changed over time, how did these very different regulatory regimes develop in, an, in a global industry, right? These oil companies are operating all over the world um, amongst democracies um, that are highly industrialized how could we have very different regulatory approaches develop um, in this particular industry? Uh, we've already talked about Deepwater Horizon. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the differences and similarities are in these international regimes and how and why did those differences develop. So there'll be a little bit of a historical take on the three countries' development over time. And then what theoretical and empirical evidence exists to suggest what the approach to regulation should be, 
right? And it turns out not, not that much. But we'll talk about what e exists and what we might do to improve empirical evidence in this domain. Um, so you can think of this in a, in a broader sense as sort of how do we study comparative evolution of policy in a really highly dynamic image so industry. So the image on the left-hand side is, uh, you know, early 1900s oil production uh, off the California coast, these long piers where they plopped oil rigs down on top, right? And then on the right is something that's a semi-submersible today in the Gulf of Mexico, much different technologies. Um, so we're going to think about that historical evolution of policy in these three countries and then come back to what does this mean for existing regulation across the three regimes. So we think about the early years in the U.S., pre-1969, pre-environmental movement, there was really almost no regulatory regime for offshore oil drilling. In order to recover damages um, for an oil spill offshore in the United States, the government actually had to prove gross negligence. So the operator actually had to be proven to do something wrong. Right? Um, in 1969, there was a spill off the coast of California in Santa Barbara, about 200,000 barrels of oil, soil about 40 miles of coastline. Um, President Nixon flies out, his interior secretary, uh, Walter Hinkle, flies out. It's all caught up in a much broader movement of the late 60s and early 70s surrounding the environment, the first Earth Day, um, Silent Spring. And so there was a lot of political attention on this spill, even in um, a Republican uh, administration, um, and even though the Secretary of the Interior was actually the former governor of Alaska, okay, a very pro-oil, generally kind of guy. Um, so what develops after Santa Barbara is the Water Quality Improvement Act of 1970 is passed in Congress, and there's really two main components of the regulatory regime here. They establish a strict liability regime, which means the government no longer has to prove negligence in order to recover damages. You, you know, if you cause an oil spill, you're liable for the damages, up to some cap, and we'll talk about the, the importance of those caps over time. And this was really a surprise to the oil industry because when he was governor of Alaska, uh, Secretary Hinkle was very opposed to these kinds of regulatory regimes for oil, but now that he was the um, Secretary of the Interior right after this major spill, he supported this. They also developed this revolving fund. So in the event of an oil spill, we want to be able to go in, clean up, and cover damages immediately. So some of that comes from the strict liability, make the companies pay. But there may be costs that have to occur even faster than they can recover money from the company, or after the company goes bankrupt or is otherwise unable to pay, or beyond the cap of their liability. So they developed this revolving fund that was supposed to pay for cleanup and, and damages, and it was going to be funded through appropriations, which means every year Congress has to give it some money. All right? So we'll see that that changes uh, over time. But that's what results after Santa Barbara. Then we have uh, you know, a 30-year period, basically, where there's no major accidents in the United States with respect to oil until we get to Exxon Valdez. But during that period, there was still a lot of policy development, but it was very much shaped by the types of policies that were adopted after Santa Barbara. So there were several new pieces of legislation in Congress, the Transatlantic Pipeline Act, the Deepwater Ports Act, and eventually the Outer Continental La Shelf Lands Act. I always get the lands and shelf backwards. Um, that extended exactly the principles that we saw uh, after Santa Barbara to these other areas of oil development, right? So there was an expansion of the strict liability regime. They each set up their own revolving funds, although they quickly figured out that relying on Congress to give you money every year is maybe not the way to go. So we'll fund these revolving funds instead with a tax on industry per unit of output, and that, that goes into this revolving fund. They additionally required that firms prove the ability to cover liability up, up to a cap so they could show that they were self-insured or that they had insurance or some other mechanism of covering their liability so they couldn't just do damage and then go bankrupt. Right? Um, and particularly under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, there was new authority 
for the, Bureau, for the Minerals Management Service or the Department of the Interior to develop command and control regulations. And the way those command and control regulations were to be developed, which was very common in environmental policy across domains at this time, was they were going to be technology standards. Okay, so we were going to specify, we being the government, is to specify um, what technologies you were required to use, and those were supposed to be specified so that they were the best available and safest technologies determined to be economically feasible. All right, so there was an implicit sort of benefit cost test there, which is different for those of you who are environmental policy folks, it's different from some of the other major pieces of um, legislation that came through in the 70s. Okay, so we see this expansion of liability, the use of these revolving funds, and the emergence of significant command and control. Are you going to ask? Are we? Yeah, ask. Well, so part of this was just observing the mischief that would go on. So coal, you know, taking off a coal mountaintop and then declaring bankruptcy. Right. Were most of these derived from the gains that were played to band aid to stop that, or were there other things too that you saw that led to this series of developments? So. Yes, I will repeat the question. So the question was, is this really a response to, uh, to bad behavior that they observed? And certainly, yes, some of that uh, was true. There is also a, a sense that um, you know, liability regime doesn't work to create an incentive for people to provide care if they're not solvent for the damages, right? So there's sort of a theoretical reason why you might want to have it. But yes, in addition, you know, you might observe that, oh, wow, we had liability, but they just declared bankruptcy, and so that didn't do us any good, and then we had to go to the revolving fund. And perhaps, in fact, we should require, and you'll see this, we should require that they show that they're solvent at least up to the liability cap, okay? So then, um, 1989, of course, Exxon Valdez ran aground off the coast of Alaska. This was, of course, not a, an oil production accident, but it was a significant event in, in policy history in this domain. Um, and in 1990, Congress passed the um, Oil Pollution Act of 1990, or OPA-90. Um, and this did several things, many of which, again, just sort of build on this trajectory that we've seen over the previous 30 years. One thing it did was consolidate all those revolving funds into one thing, right? So we had one for the pipeline, we had one for deep water ports, and we had one for offshore. We're going we're to consolidate them all in one, and we're going to pay for it with a tax on industry per, per gallon of uh, oil or gas. I guess you can't have gallon gas, but per unit of output. Um, Increased the liability cap, increased penalties, very importantly, defined damages to include damages to natural resources. Prior to this, you were liable for damages, but only economic damages that happened. So if you hurt commercial fisheries, you would be liable. If you hurt the tourism industry, you'd be liable for that. But just damages to the resource itself, you were not liable for. Um, and again, under OPA 1990, there was a significant expansion of this command and control approach, right? So we get the mandate to have the double hold tankers and various other things that come out of this, all right? So there's sort of a consolidation of 30 years of policy really in one act. So people often look at Exxon Valdez and OPA 1990 and say, well, we had an accident and then this major piece of legislation happened. And that's true. But it also, in that story, you sort of lose that there was this huge buildup of that before the accident happened, right? That sort of enabled that to happen so quickly. So then we don't have an accident for a really long time, right? And then uh, in April of 2010, we have the Deepwater Horizon, Macondo, BP, Gulf of Mexico accident. And like I mentioned before, the media raises significant concerns about the regulatory regime and whether particularly the inspectors were qualified, whether you know, they were, they were, um, the industry was meeting regulatory requirements. There was a temporary moratorium that was issued on offshore drilling. And while that was happening, there were a couple things, right? First, they broke up MMS, right? Well, they actually just dissolved MMS and renamed it. And then they broke it up. Um, so that they're separating the revenue functions and the licensing functions from the enforcement functions, thinking that maybe it's not such a great idea to have the people who are in charge of promoting development on the, on the outer continental shelf and getting the revenue for that be the same you know, office that's in charge of making sure that you're following the rules. Now, we have a chapter in the book by a colleague of mine, um, Chris Kerrigan at the George Washington Public Policy School, who argues that really 
these two, while they were under one agency, one office was in Denver, the other was in the Gulf, it wasn't really clear that there was a whole lot of um, conflict of interest in reality on the ground, and it was really the Denver folks who were in the news getting in trouble in Las Vegas with the cocaine and the hookers and all that fun stuff. Okay, so, uh, so it's a little unclear whether this was really, you know, substantive or it was really politically expedient to show that you were doing something. There were two major rules that came out after, after Deepwater Horizon, well, actually it's three because the second one has two parts. The first was almost immediately passing the, drill, uh, the drilling rule, which was more command and control regulations like we had seen particularly about the blowout preventer, right? And having better blowout preventers and being able to activate the blowout preventer with a remotely operated vehicle and a variety of additional safety technology requirements. But the big shift is the, the promulgation of the Safety Environmental Management System or SIMS rule, and then there's a SIMS 2 that came out uh, several years later, which is really a move away from this command and control approach. We're going to say, okay, if you're operating an oil rig or gas rig offshore, this is what you have to have. You have to have a blower preventer, it has to look like this. Um, it has to be able to have double blind shear ramps. All you people know way more about this than I do. Um, it has to be able to be you know, activated by a remotely operated vehicle. We're going to move away from that. We're going to still have that, but we want to put more of the onus back on industry for your individual rig, knowing that there, there's heterogeneous risks based on the geology, based on how deep the well is, et cetera. Identify what the sources of risk are and develop a management plan that's going to help reduce those risks, right? So this is the safety environmental management system rule. Um, and then it was expanded in the second one. This turns out to be a move where uh, people said, ah, the US is moving towards more of a European approach. And we'll see in a second what that European approach looks like, where we're not going to rely so heavily on command and control, these sort of checklist inspections, but instead require the industry to develop these management plans. Now, what's interesting about this is that the SIMS rule was originally proposed back in, I believe it was 1994, it was around for a long time. It had actually gone through what's called notice and comment rulemaking, and then just got shelved. And part of the reason it got shelved was because industry said, we don't need it. We actually have a recommended practice under the American Petroleum Institute that it says to do all of these things, and we're already doing all of these things, so you don't need to have a regulation on us to do all of these things that are already best practice. Okay? And so, the fact that that regulation had been promulgated and just been sitting on the shelf is part of the reason why it was able to be enacted so quickly, right? Um, so again, we see a situation where we have a crisis and it looks like there's this immediate policy response, but in fact, in order for it to be that immediate, it had to actually be building up and in some sense waiting for the, the accident to happen. Okay, so the current U.S. policy really is this hybrid. We have this strict liability regime. We still have a cap on it, so you're only liable up to a certain amount of money. We did increase the cap, but still not as much as what happened in Macondo. Um, combined with command and control regulations, this sort of more management-based, you know, safety environmental management system, develop a plan to manage the risk. Um, and there, we've split the responsibility for licensing and revenue collection from regulation and enforcement. All right, so let's look uh, in contrast at what happened in the UK. So again, initially when they started drilling for oil in the North Sea, the regulation was very poorly defined in the UK. You had to have a license, you had to have some model clauses, but they were very generic. Use industry best practices. How about it? Um, and, that, and that continued until there was an accident at the Sea Gym rig in 1965 which is a rig that actually just tilted 30 degrees and slipped into the North Sea and killed a bunch of people. Uh, and after that, there was legislation in the UK called the Mineral Workings Act of 1971, which again provided the Petroleum Engineering Division in their Department of Energy to issue command and control regulations. So a very similar pattern to what we saw in the United States. But the PED in the, in the UK was a little slow about this. So in the next, uh, nine years, they issued 11 new rules. Okay, so they had the authority to really go down this command and control path, and they used it, but it wasn't speedy by any means. Okay, at the same time in the UK, not with respect to offshore oil, 
on all other industrial safety, there was a commission chaired by Lord Robbins that raised a bunch of concerns about any one-size-fits-all regulatory, you know, sort of command and control prescriptive approach to industrial safety. Um, and recommended instead that they move towards more of a goal-oriented or risk-based approach where you say, we want you to reduce the risk you know, as low as reasonably practical or to one in a million risk of death or whatever, and then leave the onus on the industry to figure out how to do it, okay? And then hold the industry responsible for doing it, whatever they said they were going to do, okay? So this is going on. Um, at the same time, and there's another piece of legislation that enacts basically all the recommendations of the Robbins Report. So we have these two things happening in the UK at the same time, and both in theory apply to offshore oil rigs, because there are industrial plants that are covered under the Robbins Commission recommendations, but they have this o their own set of command and control regulations that are also being issued, and so these two things really exist disharmoniously for quite a while in the UK. Right? And they're fighting back and forth between who's really in charge and who has regulatory authority and you know, the normal fun politics stuff. Um, on the liability front at this time and continuing today, rather than having um, uh, these revolving funds, they have slightly different system. You are on the hook for, for liability in the UK up to a cap, just like in the US. But you have to be a member of this thing called OPAL, which the letters don't agree with what the thing stands for, and I've never figured out why, but it's the Offshore Pollution Liability Association. So you have to be a member to get a license. It's technically voluntary, but, you know, if you want to drill, you've got to have one. And you have to agree then to this strict liability up to a cap. And if the company goes bankrupt that's liable before they um, hit the cap, then there's basically group insurance. Everybody else in Opal is going to pay for the remainder of the damages based on the share of their production. Okay, so we're sort of, we're insuring one another, but really only against the insolvency risk. Okay, so if you're still solvent, you're paying all the damages, right? But if for some reason you go bankrupt, the rest of us bail you out. Okay, so that's their approach. So then they don't have this revolving fund paid for through industry, instead they have this group insurance. So this approach, uh, not the liability approach, but the other approach changed in 19, 88 with the Piper Alpha accident in the North Sea, which still is the deadliest accident um, in oil drilling history, at least on the uh, offshore. Huge loss of life, 167 of the 229 men on board the Piper Alpha died. It was a series of gas explosions combined with some pretty significant management errors. Um, uh, but because it was gas, and this is going to be an interesting difference between the North Sea, both UK and Norway, and the Gulf, or the US, because it was gas, you know, you don't have pictures of birds covered in oil. You know, tar balls are not washing up on the sand, right? So the, the focus here is really on the loss of life and on worker safety and industrial safety. And we're going to see that difference sort of persist between the two. So after the Piper Alpha accident, another Lord, another Lord Commission, Lord Cullen, um, was uh, issued a report determined that this command and control approach that they were using in the UK wasn't going to work. They should really move, just like the Robbins Commission said, they should move to this more goal-oriented approach. And so the UK adopted these recommendations and moved to something called the safety case. Okay, and again, the idea of the safety case is if you would like to drill on the UK continental shelf, you need to make a case to the regulator that you've reduced your risk as low as reasonably practical. What does that mean for the specific situation that you're going to be drilling in? And then when we fly out on the helicopter to inspect you, what we're holding you to is not some checklist that's one size fits all, but exactly what you said you were going to do in your safety case. All right? So that's the idea. Um, at this time, they also, similar to the US, separated the revenue and enforcement functions. Okay, so they had been together, and then they said, maybe that's not such a good idea, and so we'll separate them. So we're seeing a lot of parallels in this development, although at very different times, right, driven by these accidents. What's going on in Norway? So Norway, who's been there? Anybody been there? A couple of you. All right, Norway has its own like flair and approach to all things. So they have kind of a command and control approach initially, but with a Norwegian flair, which is we don't really have you know regulators in industry because it's all stat oil and, we, and the government owns that. But uh, at the time, that's not true anymore. And uh, and so we have this more cooperative approach to developing best practices and regulations. Um, 
And, we're, and there were discussions long before Piper Alpha uh, on the UK continental shelf about developing what they refer to as these internal systems of control, which are a whole lot like the safety case and the safety environmental management system, just a different term for that. Um, but they finally pushed that one through again after an accident. So in 1980, the Alexander Keeland, which, is, which was a floatal, floating hotel servicing another rig, uh, capsized in gale force wind, killed um, you know, just over half of the people who were on board. Again, loss of life, no real environmental damage. They, were, they weren't drilling on the Alexander Keeland. It was being used as a hotel. And so that provided the impetus for expansion of this goal-oriented approach and the development of what's become Norway's very unique tripartite system. Um, it is similar to the safety case and the, the, the safety environmental management systems in some ways. I mean, it is true that for each rig or for each operation, they're developing, they're identifying their sources of risk and they're developing plans to minimize those risks, right? So there's not a one-size-fits-all approach. So it's similar in that respect. Um, but it's not similar in that it, it, the Norwegians still have a very different approach to enforcement, right? And the way I like to think about it, having hung out with them now for a while, is they really have regulation by engineers. You know, we have regulation by lawyers. They have regulation by engineers. So the way they view this is that, you know, we all went to school together. Some of us work for Statoil. Some of us are in the are heads of the labor union, and some of us um, work for the national uh, for the petroleum directorate. And when we think we have a problem, we sit down in a room and we talk about how we're going to solve this problem. And so when you look at their enforcement actions, that really never gets much above the strongly worded letter, right? It's a very different type of an enforcement environment in Norway. Okay? Other aspects of their regulation, they actually really didn't specify much about liability until fairly recently, but they do have unlimited liability. So the only one of the three countries that we're talking about today that does not have a cap on their liability. The way this works is that uh, most of the operations on the Norwegian continental shelf involve a series of different licensees and one of them is the head and it used to be always stat oil but now it's not. Um, and so if there's an incident, the damages are assigned to the lead operator and if they're not solvent to cover them, then they get, they get divvied out to the other ones. The idea is I'm just going to make stat oil pay and then stat oil can figure out which of its contractors are going to pay them back. right? Um, and again, just like we saw in the UK and in the US, in 2004, Norway also split the revenue generating functions from the enforcement functions, but it was highly controversial at the time that they do it. And several of the um, sort of safety and petroleum engineers that I've talked to over there were very opposed to this idea. And it was not really motivated by an accident in the same way that it was in the UK and in the United States. All right, so what does all of this mean? So we saw a somewhat similar trajectory in, in, with some differences, but some very strong similarities. All of them sort of started with this command and control approach. All eventually develop a strict liability regime. But quite universally, almost, with the exception of that 2004 thing in Norway, major regulatory developments were promulgated by accidents or, uh, on that country's own continental shelf. Okay, so Piper Alpha happens in the North Sea, and that completely changes the way the UK thinks about regulation. It doesn't have an effect in the United States, right? That was 1988, right? And so yes, people were talking about these safety cases, and certainly this is, these are global companies, and they have to operate under those rules in the UK, but we don't see that sort of same push in the United States until after Deepwater Horizon, right? And similarly, it was after an accident in the Norwegian continental shelf that they sort of moved. Um, towards this more management-based approach. We saw in all three cu countries that they eventually decoupled enforcement from revenue generation. Um, and again, with the, with the accidents, I think one thing that gets lost, and, and we bring this out more in the book because we have many more case studies that we can look at there, is that it is the case that you see, if you just look at the, at the timeline, accident, major piece of legislation, right? Accident, major piece of legislation. But usually, if you dig a little deeper, what you're seeing is actually sort of a progression in the policy stream towards what the next step should be. And then after the accident happens, there's this political window that opens that allows them to push it through. All right? So these are not usually brand new ideas. In fact, sometimes, like in the case of the safety and environmental management systems rule, well, 
It had already been out there and, and gone through notice and comment, was sort of sitting around. Okay, so that's on the sort of historical or, or positive side. What has happened? How did we get to where we are today? Where should we be? What should the approach to offshore oil and gas regulation be? Is this apparent convergence and strict liability, maybe with, maybe without a cap, some command and control, but a lot of focus on these safety environmental management systems, is that we've sort of got a convergence in those to, towards that sort of a system? Does that system work better? Is, there, is that a good thing, this convergence? Um, so I'm an empiricist by nature, and the, my initial interest in this problem was after they passed the safety environmental management systems rule in the US, I thought, this is going to be great. We're going to have data on near misses at all these different rigs, and we're going to be able to go in and say, you know, the UK did it here, and Norway did it, well, Norway did it here, and UK did it here, and the US did it here. We're going to be able to see what impact it has on safety. And it turns out you can't do that because while each of the countries do have data on near misses, they're not comparable in any way that you could use them for that kind of an empirical assessment. So we're going to have to think a little bit in more nuanced ways about whether or not this convergence that we have in the regulatory regimes across the three countries is in fact a good thing or a bad thing. So let's first think a little bit about what theory has to say. Um, no equations or any scary economics here. But uh, in general, um, most economists would argue that a strict liability regime or liability regime should in fact provide incentives for proper risk management. Thank you. Um, the cap that we have on the liability, so you're only liable up for you know, $25 million, deters that incentive quite a bit, right? If we're looking at damages from a condo that are you know, 10 or 20 times as high as the cap, it's not clear that the liability regime is going to provide the right kinds of incentives. But even if we got rid of the cap, and Norway doesn't have a cap, firms might not have accurate expectations of risk for a variety of reasons. One is the infrequency of really bad events makes updating in a Bayesian fashion possible, even if we believe we're all sitting around updating in Bayesian ways. Um, the nature of the industry uh, with the, with the non-vertical integrations, so you have a variety of different companies doing different components on the, on the rig, can also lead to it being difficult for the chief operator to understand what the nature of risk might be. Command and control regulations can also lower the perception of perceived risk, right? Because there are all these additional uh, overlapping redundant safety rules. I call them belts and suspenders, right? We're going to have 16 different ways to turn this thing off if we have a blowout. And so you start to believe, well, they can't all fail at once, right? I've got 16 different ways to turn this thing off. And what we saw at Macondo is they all failed at once. And then when you look back, you think, well, it's not that surprising, perhaps, because they all have things in common. The, the probability of them all failing is not independent, right? It's, there's, you know, there's correlation in those probabilities because they're being maintained by the same people or by the same company or people get fatigued. There's a variety of ways in which when one thing goes wrong, a whole bunch of things might go wrong. And that happened at McConnell and also happened at Piper Alpha. And, and I think that's one of the lessons to take away from this is that you know, we, we often think because we have all of these redundancies built in, that's making us safer. Usually it is, but um, when, they all, when they do go wrong, they can kind of all go wrong at the same time. On the theoretical side with respect to these management-based regulations, the SIMs and the safety cases and the tripartite system, whatever we want to call them, theory tells us, and I've done some work myself on this, that those are actually pretty good approaches to regulation when you can't directly observe the outcome, which is certainly true here. We don't have big accidents very often, thankfully. All right, so we don't observe risk, per se. Um, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the risk. Right, which we think is probably true for offshore oil based on the geology and the conditions and whatnot. There's this complementarity between effort and risk reduction. That's kind of a geeky econ way of saying if I invest more in, in safety management, it'll likely lower the costs or increase the benefits of what I do with respect to risk. And importantly, firms aren't already engaging in this activity. So it makes sense to do this in a regulatory fashion. The government requires you to do it if firms aren't already doing it. And if they're already doing it, then there's no point, right? And so this was the argument that was being made in the US back in the 90s was that we don't need to have this SIMS rule because we already have API recommended practice 75, I believe it is, 
that, that basically lays out all of these things as best practices. Okay. What data do we have empirically? And like I said before, not much. Um, and what we do have is uh, more like slips, trips, and falls than kicks or leaks or things like that. All right, but here we've got in the dark, in the black, uh, US waters, and in the uh, gray, European waters, and we've got total medical treatment incidents, total restricted work incidents, um, and total lost time incidents between 2007 and 2009 per 1 million person hours. So this is uh, a time period when we did have this more goal-oriented or management-based approach in Europe, but not in the United States. We were still command and control and liability. Okay, and so you see, yeah, there are you know more uh, medical treatment incidents and restricted work incidents in U.S. waters than in European waters in that time. But if you look at total lost time incidents, it goes the other way. I, you know, I don't know how compelling this is, but for at least from the data that we do have, it doesn't jump out at you and say, "Wow, this this other approach is so much better." It leads to reductions in slips, trips, and falls. And again, slips, trips, and falls isn't what we really care about, but the safety case in the UK and the Norwegian approach are supposed to deal with both, the worker safety and the environmental damages. And so if it was really so much better, we might expect to see you know, a slightly more consistent picture. So we can look to some other settings where they use this management approach um, and see if we, you know, does it work there? And do those, do, can we learn anything from that about offshore oil? And there is, in fact, some evidence that management-based approaches work for toxic chemical releases. This, you know, a million moons ago was actually one of my dissertation chapters. Um, and there is some evidence that it has worked to um, lower accidents in the chemical industry where they have uh, uh, a similar sort of program. But when we really look at offshore oil, we don't have, again, those kind of big statistical studies to look at. But after Deepwater Horizon, the UK wanted to say, as did Norway, this could not happen here, right? Our system is better. And so the UK actually sent some people out to, to do an, you know, an evaluation of the safety case and whether or not it was really reducing risk and could a BP type disaster happen on the UK continental shelf. And when they went out there, what they found was not all that promising. So the goal of the safety case was it was going to be this living document, constantly updated. People would be you know, using the safety case to help them evaluate risk management decisions on sort of a day-to-day -day or at least week-by-week -week or month-by-month -month basis on the rig. And what they found when they went out there was it was kind of a dusty document in somebody's file cabinet, and they found a lot of the kinds of problems that you might worry about that certain safety systems weren't being maintained the way they should be, et cetera, right? So, you know, again, as an empiricist, I don't say, well, that means that they don't work, but it's not the sort of compelling evidence of, wow, we went out there and, and it's completely different here than when we would go out in the Gulf of Mexico. So what does this all imply? I think this is my last slide. Am I good? Okay. Um, so we've seen this convergence in regulatory regimes across the three countries to a hybrid that has command and control, strict liability, and uh, management-based regulation. But despite that convergence, there really is limited empirical evidence that this approach is superior in any way to what we had in place before Macondo. All right. Um, and so what I, what I want to argue, for, what I argue regularly to policymakers for, is we really need to do better data collection and, and um, mandated data reporting on things like near misses that we could use to actually evaluate, do comparative evaluation in a, in a more statistical way between different countries' regulatory regimes or even different companies' regular, you know, uh, uh, application of those regulatory regimes. So that's it. Thank you. And questions. Were you going to drive the question we have? Yeah. Or you, you're going to drive it? I'm not going to drive. I'll just answer. He's going to point at you. <laughs> he's, got, he's got the, uh, the rock star mic. Students first, please. Any students? So what incentives do the companies have to report near misses and... I mean, why can't they just sweep it under the carpet? Well, they don't have any incentives. So what I'm saying is what we actually need is, is as part of the regulatory approach, mandated reporting of near misses in a way that's comparable, right? And that we don't, we don't have that right now. We do have it in 
other industries, but we don't have it for offshore oil. So you're right, they don't have any incentive. Are you? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so there's a hue and cry about being efficient these days, you know, cost cutting. And on the other side, we have a uh, lot like super majors coming in uh, into U.S. land and coming with an offshore mentality. Like uh, I remember I was on a rig with BP and Transocean. We had a five-hour long safety meeting. So where are we headed? Uh, I mean, you know, it, all the rules we see is almost written in blood. But where where is the industry headed in terms of, you know, they want to maintain cost efficiencies at the same time. Uh, you know, there's an increase in uh, uh, regulation. So where, where is it headed? I mean, just, just to... Yeah, well, that's a great question. I mean, I think... Um, uh, I, I think where it's headed in the U.S., frankly, I mean, I, I, I personally would be surprised if we saw much uh, more new regulatory activity, so I, I, unless we had another accident, which let's hope we don't. Um, except for the Alaska rule, which is supposed to be coming out any minute, but it's been supposed to be coming out any minute for the last three or four months. So, um, but for the for the Gulf, I don't know that we're going to see a lot more regulatory new regulations. And so then, you know, it's it's basically about the industry figuring out you know cost effective ways to deal with the regulations they have. But again, as they found in the UK, you know, you can have the safety environmental management system. You can do it. Right? You can engage in the planning process and sort of say, okay, here's what my risks are. If it doesn't become part of the culture, right? if you have a five-hour safety meeting and that's it, we checked that box, we did safety meeting with workers, go forth. And then once you're out there, it's like, okay, well, we can't wait for those extra centralizers because we're already you know, six weeks over or whatever. It's going to become a problem. right? So regulation like this, even the more flexible form, can't possibly substitute for, at the end of the day, you know, industry responsibility, right? Which is where the liability side comes in, you know. And and one thing that will happen after you have a big oil spill is, you know, people go, oh my goodness, it could actually be really costly, you know. And so we probably, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if people are taking that liability thing more seriously now, especially because BP was found grossly negligent, right? So they're on the hook for some not only the liability but some really significant penalties potentially under the Clean Water Act. So, but then, you know, naturally, just like for all of us, with our attention, you know, we got focused, we're, we're going to think about this hard, and then nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, and so we go back to focusing on, on costs. And so this is the, this is the trade-off all the time in, in, in these things. It's even worse in, in, in this industry because of the nature of the payments for people who are on the rig and, uh, and what their incentives are versus the payments for the inspectors, but that's a whole other, wait, do we, wait, uh, I'm not supposed to drive. <laughs> hey, I was trying to figure out what you're trying to do empirically and how you're planning on doing it. Yeah. And I was wondering just about all the heterogeneity in the three different bodies of water that you're looking at, so U.S., Norway, U.K., and how you're dealing with that, because you're trying to calculate based off of how many safety incidences there have right. been. But are the companies the same? Is the water the same? Did you learn to do it? No, of course. So, oh. so, um, so this is like the least empirical thing I've ever probably written. Um, and, and you know, normally when we have you know large panels of data that measure some outcome, whatever it might be, lots of work on toxics. So toxics releases. Yeah, it happens from all sorts of different facilities, in different industries, in different states, and we have to control for all of that in our regression analysis, right, so that we try to figure out, like, well, what's the impact of Massachusetts did this and nobody else did? Well, Massachusetts is different for a lot of reasons. I lived there for a long time. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, if I had all those data, if there were really near-miss data that were comparable, every time there was a hydrocarbon kick, we're going to, you know, and, and give me some, some measurements of that. If that existed, you could try to structure an empirical assessment like that. Right now, you can't. I mean, right now, literally, you have those, as best I can tell you, have those data, slips, trips, and falls. Here's how many there are. You know, you, you, I don't even know what rig they came from, so I can't even control for those kinds of heterogeneity, which is why we're left sort of with this feeling thing of there's been this convergence, but nobody really knows that this is any better than what we've had before. Oh. I've got a question as well. Yeah. Um, so following regulation and safety is very expensive. And when you constantly change it, that compounds that expense. 
So my first question is, is how receptive are the oil rig companies to these constant changing regulations? Are they included in the process of, of the changing regulation? And then the second question is, if we become overly regulated in our areas that we invite these companies to explore and profit, aren't we just going to eventually drive them away to countries that don't have the regulations? Both great questions. So how, let's take the first one. How involved are they in the regulatory process? Well, for all of these rules, they're going to be what, what are called major rules. They're going to cost more than a million uh, US dollars. So they go through, um, uh, they first are proposed. Then they go through a 90-day public comment period, right? And then the agency actually has to respond to every one of those comments. And in the dark ages, when I worked in consulting, I actually got to do that for a while. That's really pretty miserable. But you have to respond to every single one of the comments. And then they'll issue a final rule. Um, so there's that formal process where they're involved. And of course, there's lots of informal channels in which they, they get involved in helping shape this regulation. Do I think that the oil industry is, and gas industry is excited about new regulation? Not even a little bit, right? And they fought a lot of that for a long time and, and probably would have, again, under the same grounds they did before, we don't need this, we already have these best practices, um, except for it was kind of hard right after Macondo to be like, yeah, okay, everything's great in our industry, right? So, so part of the reason why you tend to see regulatory activity after accidents is that there's pressure from the industry to say, you know, this is costly for us. It is costly. One might argue there, there are benefits as well, but there's no doubt that there are costs. Um, and so, you know, you have that natural tension. Your second question was, will this drive people uh, elsewhere? You know, I don't know. I mean, uh, a colleague of mine said she was in Malaysia when the, when the ruling came down from Judge Barbier in uh, New Orleans that BP was grossly negligent and all of them were saying, oh, nobody's going to go do any work in the U.S. anymore. Um, it's possible that that could cause people to go to Mexico instead. Um, but uh, on the other side, on the benefit side, we probably don't want to have a regulatory regime where you can spill a lot of oil and then not be held liable for it, right? So I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, but that's my answer. <laughs> so, <clears throat> thank you for coming all the yeah. way. Very interesting. Um, you'd mentioned a very interesting point about the, the skills base of the Norwegian regulators, engineers mm -hmm. versus lawyers. And so I think that that deserves more description. And also, so the regulatory culture and skill base and then also clearly the management of the different companies in the types. You know, deep sea is a sport of kings. You don't go in there right. like fracking right. as a little entrepreneur. Right. Right. And so there are different cultures. And the, the BP culture from other sources that I have in the industry kind of indicated that a lot of the other players are somewhat, were somewhat upset at BP's behavior in, in the continuous or multiple... Uh, decisions made along that whole failure chain mm -hmm. that led eventually to it. Yeah. And so can you talk about a little bit about the management culture sure. of the different companies and the regulatory culture? And secondly, um, I think there were some interesting uh, ideas with the FAA years ago about separating the promotion side of aviation versus the regulatory and so they went through that yeah. and if you have some lessons from the FAA and regulating that that you can apply here at the okay, interesting. Great. Uh, all right so um, so the cultures all right so the the Norwegian culture is really unique as best I can tell anywhere in the world and they are very proud of their regulatory culture um, to the point where sometimes I'm like, you know, guys, be careful, because we had the best regulatory regime if you just measure lack of accidents right up until the moment we didn't, um, when, when the accident happened at, at Macondo. So you haven't had an accident in a long time. We hadn't had one in even longer. So, you know, but they're very proud of it. It is very different. It is, you know, Statoil is now not a public company anymore, and the rules about who gets to operate in the, in the Norwegian continental shelf are changing. I think it will be very interesting to see how this culture that they've built up of, you know, a bunch of people who went to school together are petroleum engineers. Some are in the government. Some are at Statoil. 
and some go represent the labor unions and how they kind of have built that trust and that collaboration and are able to solve problems in that way. Will that be robust to changes in the industry structure when you're not dealing with stat oil and your buddies at stat oil that you went to school with? And I think that's going to, we just don't know how that's going to play out. But that's part of what's going on there is that they've just had a very different approach. Um, and, and the U.S. and the U.K. share this sort of common law history and a more legalistic approach to regulation. Um, in terms of the, the cultures, I mean, I haven't talked to folks at BP uh, about their safety culture, but I've certainly heard the same things that you've heard um, about uh, other companies saying that, that, you know, basically couldn't happen to us, that BP was known to be kind of a reckless player, that they clearly made bad decisions. Um, and again, we don't necessarily need more regulation. If we're already doing what we're supposed to be doing, this shouldn't have happened, right? Um, and there are, there are lots of sociologists and sort of industrial psychologists who work on how you create a culture of safety, and that's not really in my domain. But you know, that's certainly something that, that, um, that other people worry about. And then your last question was, Lessons from the uh, OK, so, so I don't have that specifically about their transferring the revenue function, but I will say that as part of this book, we are looking at the role of sort of standing investigatory bodies that are independent um, to sort of diagnose what happened in the crisis and what the right, the right um, identify the problems and what potential solutions might be. For example, the National Transportation Safety Board is the best known one, and they are in fact independent of um, the FAA or a Department of Transportation or any of the regulatory agencies that actually write the rules so that they can actually go in afterwards and objectively say, well, it was your bad rule that was partially contributing to the fact that we had this airline crash or the railroad derailment or whatever. So uh, we are trying to learn from aviation in that way. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to you at length about that. But um, let's see if we, we have a couple more questions. And then I'll come back, because I've talked about the NTSB all day. <laughs> Um, thank you for coming again. Um, from your presentation, it seems like the U.S. has been spurred by concerns over the environment, and the yeah. other countries have been over safety for their humans. And then from your bar graph, it kind of gave off the thing that the U.S. hurts more humans and, like, the <laughs> Europeans um, and damage the environment a little bit more. Is that a correct idea? And um, despite the differences and maybe how they were how regulation came, like safety-wise, are they comparable, like the standards between these European countries in the U.S.? Safety-wise, are the regulations comparable between them? Um, well, um, no, in the following way. I mean, in Norway in particular, the labor has a a much more powerful role in industrial development, and so they have they have arguments over whether they should be whether they should uh, be allowed to force workers to have a roommate on their rig. I'm not thinking that happens around here very much. Okay, so so the, the the nature of the debate is very different in part because of different cultures and the role of labor in the Norwegian culture. Labor is historically been a little stronger in the UK, but not as much since the Thatcher administration. So, um, so it's not clear that they're necessarily directly comparable in that, I guess, uh, in that way. And you had a second question. No? It was mostly that, like, despite the origins of how they, they're spurring on this regulation, like, safety-wise, like, talking valves and pipes and human contracts and how they're supposed to act on the rig, is it comparable between Europe and the U.S.? Um, yeah, yes and no. I mean, so, you know, the, the safety things that they're supposed to be doing um, in large part are, are similar. Um, and, uh, for example, the Piper Alpha accident was caused because somebody didn't tighten a flange when they were temporarily checking a pressure valve and um, they tightened it with their hands instead of with a wrench. and. It's a, long, it's a long, very sad story. But like those kinds of things of what you're supposed to be doing in terms of the actual work on the rig probably don't differ a huge amount between these three countries because we're talking about, for the most part, major global oil companies. Um, so in that sense, they're similar. The role of labor and how much labor can demand from, different, from those same global companies in different countries is actually quite different. Um, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. My question is, are the three kind of countries and companies that you've kind of, you've picked, 
are those the three like most extreme in the world um, in terms of like regulation and management style? And then, sorry, and then, yeah. um, let me think. My other question was that when a company like Statoil, let's say they have a certain company culture in Norway, when they come to the United States and they like buy land in the Eagle Fred or something, does that management style and like regulation style like actually transfer over since they end up hiring people and talent in the United States? Yep. It's a great question. Both of them. Um, so they're the three largest uh, industrialized democracy offshore oil po uh, producers. We, we could talk about Russia, but okay. So, um, well, well, so well, well, that's why I chose them, right? So in some sense, you might not be, and because a lot of the players operate, the, 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 the companies operate in all three places, and so you might expect this kind of harmonization from just from private governance itself, right? And there's a huge, you know, literature on this, right? So that maybe, you know, these differences in, in public regulation don't matter as much because, you know, if I've got to do this on the rigs in the UK, I might as well do it on the ones, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico too. It's just cheaper for me to have a uniform approach to this across all of these countries. And I think there has been some evidence of that in other areas, in other industrial domains, um, and, and I'm sure here too, um, although I'm always struck by the irony that BP was a British company, right, with lots of experience in the safety case model, so this idea that like the safety case is so great, that's the way we should go. It's like, all right, well, BP was the one that caused the oil spill, and they have a lot of experience with the safety case. So as they as they all do, but because BP is actually a British company, you think like if that's if there's that kind of transference, you should be seeing that activity um, in the U.S. And we clearly weren't, at least in that case. One more. All right, we started a couple minutes late, so we gotta we gotta eke a couple couple more minutes out. Can does your uh, study account for kind of differences, stepping back and more political to higher political level, like differences by the fact that you know UK is a parliamentary system and the US is kind of the, has the congressional kind of preservation of minority rights, and so there tends to be kind of more onerous regulations in non-parliamentary systems. Do you guys account for that at all? Um. No, I mean, not directly. I mean, there's no regression to account for something directly in. Um, I think what's interesting is that in the, in the U.S., we haven't seen a major new piece of environmental legislation in a long time, right? So all of this was regulation that was done under enabling legislation that happened back when you could still do it. Um, and that, that constraint on new legislation is not binding necessarily in the UK and Norway right now. But even there, when they have the, the accidents, they didn't always promulgate new pieces of legislation through parliament. Some of it was just you know, in the regulatory domain, so in the Department of Energy or in the Petroleum Directorate in Norway. So it certainly does matter. I don't know that it mattered too much for the trajectory that we, we've seen here. It very well might matter for the trajectory going forward because I don't see it getting a lot easier to pass new pieces of environmental legislation in Congress anytime soon. One last quick question, Lauren. <laughs> Hi, thanks. That was really interesting. A related question. You spoke a little bit about the success uh, of, reg of regulations in chemical and toxins industry. Um, so, it, you know, since the 60s and 70s, there have always been uh, citizen-driven initiatives regarding nuisance and trespass and so on, um, uh, which have sort of both sort of a been a win-win uh, for the citizens as well as from the environmental perspective. So do you think um, sort of the absence of such citizen uh, debates in oil uh, offshore regulations sort of have resulted in uh, uh, not so strict standards? Thanks. That's a great question. Um, so um, I don't know that I have a good answer. I mean, it, it probably uh, does matter, although there's no shortage of environmental advocacy um, uh, against uh, hydrocarbon extraction right now. Um, but you write that you don't have the same sense of like, this is in my neighborhood, and you're you know, releasing this much toxic chemical, and now I know about it, and I want you to stop doing it, right? Or the, the, so that you, can't, you don't have the same kind of grassroots activism at the local level. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm sure that, that does contribute in part to this, this distinction.
thank, great I have to say, thank you all so much. It's always fun. It's not my first time in Texas, but it's my first time in Austin, so. I will.